All right, so thank you everyone for attending our fourth quarter webinar for 2020. Today we're going to be discussing a few case studies of some of the common design and installation problems we've seen through the year, how we've helped to you know, partner with our partners to help solve the problems, uh, try and educate some of them on some unique things, um, you know, helped, helped their customers, helped our customers, and everybody ended up winning. So like I said, I'm going to keep everybody muted till the end of the presentation, and then after the presentation, we'll open it up for questions. I can advance the slide. So this is the general outline for how the presentation should flow. I'm hoping to keep it within 50, 55 minutes with a few minutes at the end for questions. And at any time outside of the presentation, if you want to ask us any questions, feel free to reach out. So I wanted to start off by going through some brief introductions to the key players in our company and, and what each of us do. Uh, so here's our staff that you could be directly interfacing with to get your projects quoted or designed. First off, top left is Tim Combs, our president. He's been in and around the industry for 25 plus years. He's a very knowledgeable resource of industry history and you know little tips and tricks on how to get stuff done. So he's a great resource. Uh, second to him, uh, Bill Sears is our uh, national sales director. This time he also takes care of our lower Midwest region for sales. Then we have Luke Curley. Uh, he's our upper Midwest regional sales manager stationed up near Detroit. Jack Puck is our Southeast regional sales manager down in Atlanta. And he primarily focuses on hollow bar and hydroway. And then finally, Jim Sorrell is our national and international hydroway sales rep. He's been here a long time and he's extremely knowledgeable of the product line. So these four individuals can assist you with our product lines, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. So moving on, our engineering staff is currently comprised of Sam Pappas and myself, Sean Hibbets. We take care of engineering quoting, design assistance during the design phase, like calcs, drawings, VE options, and also during installation. We look to try to be creative and try to come up with unique solutions when we're presented with tough design scenarios. We really like problem solving. So then in addition to ourselves, we also retain the services of a good number of very experienced geostructural engineers throughout our territory, and they can help assist us with completed turnkey engineering submittal packages for our designs. So we can definitely do our part in providing high-level engineering assistance in many engineering situations. And then finally, we have Josh and Chris, who are our operations staff in St. Louis, and then we have James and Eddie, who's our operations staff up in Detroit. So those are the guys that are taking care of the orders when they're placed, making sure that everything's stocked and making sure everything's shipped out quickly for your needs. So we have two warehouse locations in Caseyville, Illinois, which is pretty much St. Louis, and Livonia, Michigan, which is pretty much Detroit. And uh, we represent these brands as well as some others that help us provide a wide, wide array of engineering solutions to our partners. So first off, Chance and Atlas represents our line of helical anchors and resistance piers or push piers. We're one of a handful of Chance distributors representing a good portion of the middle of the country up through the Northeast. Chance is an extremely well-respected manufacturer with over 100 years in the industry. Second, we have MagnaCore, which is our brand of hollow bar micropile, which is a specific type of micropile installation. Um, you know, it, it's really, really good for keeping a hole open and, and is very comparable, uh, eco, you know, economics wise to um, competing with a conventional micro pile where you have to advance casing. So it's a great one pass method of installation and it's very effective in maintaining an open hole in collapsible soils. And then we got Carbon Bond, which is our carbon fiber structural crack repair system. Uh, it's a composite resin carbon fiber reinforcing that provides tensile strength to existing structures and it can increase the capacity of a structure or help repair it if it's undergone cracking failures. It's an effective bandage that can potentially reduce the cost associated with changing the strengths of an existing member. And then finally we have HydroWay, which is our geosynthetic wrapped strip drain product. It's an effective way of transmitting water without moving soils through an underground pipe channel. Um, it, it has a very high inflow and flow through rate, 
and it's a very cost-effective underground piping and water management solution. So I wanted to include my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on anything you see today or, or any other questions on our product lines uh, or want to see something presented in the future, uh, feel free to reach out and contact me at any point or any of our sales staff as well. So here's a quick graphic representation of our footprint with Chance, Helical Piers, and Atlas Resist Resistance Piers. This is our territory where our partners are based, and we have a lot of activity and experience in these areas with local engineers and contractors. This image shows the footprint of, of our Holobar micropile. Obviously, it's the whole United States, but we're, we're able to sell outside of the United States as well if we need to. Um, you know, Feel free to reach out to us if you need any assistance, design, or, or installation. Um, we, can, we can definitely help with that. And finally, our hydroway footprint is, is obviously international. So we currently sell and market this solution worldwide. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any need for that. So the first topic I wanted to go over um, for our case studies is um, uh, an example of why it's helpful to have us early on in a project as a second set of eyes. Uh, as I discussed earlier, Sam and I head up our engineering staff and, and we help a lot of people with designs, troubleshooting and estimating and, and making sure that the most efficient pile, you know, makes its way into a project. Um, and like I said before, also we have a number of external engineers, you know, we, we use for helping sign and seal designs for our partners. And they have extensive industry knowledge in their areas and within their fields. Um, and they're a mixture of geotechnical and structural specialists. And they're what I like to call our preferred engineer network. And they have a very broad ability to cover the country with their licensure. So uh, we can definitely help you help help lean on them. All right, so this project started off with a structural engineer reaching out to us to help them come up with a layout for a new mat foundation pad to support some new heavy equipment that was being shipped in. Uh, initially, they had 45 elements planned with about half of them being large loads and the other half being relatively lighter. And uh, they started their design where they took a reasonable spacing or what they thought was a reasonable spacing and came up with their loads and then sized the bar for one that would overperform to that load or the next size up. So that was a SS200 material. So they wanted us to determine if this would work and if we could manage getting them those materials relatively quickly because they needed to have everything installed and set up before the equipment arrived. So because they came to us first, we were able to help fit them into something that would have a couple of benefits that they didn't necessarily think about. Um, first, with the loads they had come up with compared to the strength of the bar, they had kind of selected something that was the next size up, which is which is fine, but you know it wouldn't have any structural problems being a solution, but that's relatively inefficient. You know, you want to select something or you want to get your loads to be about the the capa upper capacity of the bar just for efficiency. Uh, so 120 kips divided by 160 kip capacity for the SS200 isn't really the best price per kip. So additionally, on these projects, you have to consider both the structural capacity and the geotechnical capacity. So as a structural, you're always worried about loads and, and making sure that nothing's going to break. But one of the other things on the job is the soils. And you can size something that will structurally work but it'll, you'll never really get to a capacity from a geotechnical standpoint if the soils aren't there. You could add you know, bolt-on extensions and you can do a, a grouted helical as well, but if it's just not the best way to go, you know, then you can't do anything about it. You have to adjust your, your loads to fit the site as well. So as a, additionally, as a big part of their request was availability-based, you know, we wanted to make sure that we helped select something that could they, we could throw on a truck without any delays and get it shipped to the site. So ultimately, uh, we ended up, you know, having a few discussions with them and we ended up adding a few more elements into the larger loaded half of the mat foundation. Um, this re resulted in less load per element, which we were able to size it down to an SS-175 material, which is a, a, a less material. Um, but we only added a few elements. Additionally, uh, based on the soils that were at the site, they were able to save on theoretical length and didn't need to have a bolt-on extension. 
you know, so we could go to a three plate uh, lead section instead of a four plate. So overall, uh, there was less cost for this configuration than what they were originally planning with a solution that was ready to ship because we, we had a lot of that SS-175 material, material ready. We also provided them some education, uh, had a lot of great back and forth conversations about our different elements that we supply. You know, we, we educated them on helical pull down micro piles, he grouted helicals, uh, the benefits and drawbacks of that. And in the end, you know, we're gonna set them up with an installation partner that we work with uh, relatively often, you know, who we trust to get it all installed. And, and I felt that, you know, we really helped them get everything buttoned up nice. And they gave us good feedback that they really appreciate, appreciated our help. And, and we really got them into something that worked perfectly for them. So I'm not going to go through all these, but, you know, it really it boils down to anytime you're planning on using one of our elements on a project, feel free to reach out to us at any time. You know, we're just, we can be here for a second set of eyes, a sounding board for, you know, do, do you think this is going to work? You know, it's a quick email, it's a quick phone call. It's not, you know, anything for me to pick up the phone and, you know, have a five minute conversation about a job and, and figure out if, if something seems like it's going to work or if there's going to be problems. Um, additionally, if there's another deep foundation element on a job and you think our elements could be used as a VE option, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm not going to say that I know everything because uh, because I don't, but I you know have quite a few years of looking at designs with deep foundation elements, intermediate foundation elements, and I really like to look at things and you know figure out problems and you know I like to be helpful. So and like I said, we have a you know resources of a external handful of engineers that we can reach out to if if I don't know the answer. I have a great resource network to to reach out to if if I don't know the answer. So. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Sam, uh, and he's going to talk about lateral support brackets. You can flip to the next one here. So uh, historically, uh, we almost always face some type of lateral load on boardwalk structures, and there's a few ways you can you can handle uh, a lateral load in a boardwalk. The first, which is you know probably the most expensive, so we don't often go down this road, is upsizing the the pipe shaft to be able to handle that lateral load. And you know whenever you've got a boardwalk and the shaft is sticking out of the ground a few feet, uh, any lateral load is going to cause a pretty significant moment. So that solution, typically you have to upsize the pipe pretty good, so we don't often go with that. Um, historically, our solution has been a tab that's welded onto the traditional boardwalk bracket at a 45 degree angle, which we'll show on the next slide here. But there's been some issues with that in the past in terms of you have to install your vertical element first and then your boardwalk bracket and then install your tie back and, and hope that it lines up, uh, you know, with that tie back when it all comes to uh, fruition and you're ready to put your thread bar through it. and Historically, it's it's been a challenging task to get those to line up perfectly. So you know, alongside Chance, we've developed this new bracket, as you can see on the screen here. And basically, the, the top right image that you see there, those two holes would be bolted directly to the frame of the boardwalk. And then you would slip your thread bar uh, up through that center hole there. And once we, I think you can switch to the next slide here. So on the left image here, is the traditional boardwalk element so you can kind of see how you'd have to have that perfectly lined up with that vertical element so uh, there's also some pretty significant capacity limitations to this design uh, that tab can only be so thick so it's you know in cases where you've got a higher lateral load you you really may not be able to to do much with this classic style uh, lateral support tab but as shown on the right here, um, you know, this is gonna greatly improve, improve installability because you can install your tie back, uh, then, then put on your yoke assembly, your thread bar, and then bolt it to your boardwalk frame. So you don't have to be you know, as precise with your install with this uh, new lateral support bracket as you do with uh, the previous lateral support bracket. And there's also some uh, significant improvements in the ability to scale this up uh, in terms of load. 
you know, if you if you need a, a higher higher load, all you'd have to do is upsize this this angle this angle bracket and use larger bolts. And you know, if if necessary, maybe you'd have to up your your thread bar diameter as well. But you know, essentially, uh, I'd like to see us using more of these in the future rather than the classical style. You know, for for both the installability issues and the uh, you know ability to scale up the load. So. I think this is going to be a useful tool in the toolbox for our partners to to know that you know this product exists, and we we have an off the shelf uh, one by chance that we can that we can quote at any time. So uh, you'll probably see this classic style tie back on most plan sets, um, but that isn't to be said that you couldn't swap it out for this you know this new lateral support tie back on the right here. Uh, you know, especially in cases where you've got a higher load. So. Uh, I think this this is a pretty beneficial uh, tool we've got in the toolbox now. You want to flip the slide? So now uh, another thing that we've kind of had success with in the past is coaching our partners on uh, you know the correct way to stage material, uh, and it seems like it's a pretty fundamental thing. Um, but you know I still think it's important to to hit on this so that uh, you know everyone can kind of understand. The expectations of what a, a good work site should look like and, and how workflow should be you know staged from that so go ahead and flip to the next slide so material staging um you know is best suited on a per pile basis what you don't want to do is uh you know take a bunch of elements and throw them all in a pile uh near near the hole you're, you're working on so without without counting them out so whenever we have uh, you know, a pile plan and each pile, HP1, HP2, HP3, uh, whatever, will have their own design. You know, sometimes they could all be the same, but you know, each one is going to have some type of anticipated depth. So let's say we're working with 28 feet. You'd want to stage you know, your four seven-foot sections of bar um, you know, at that hole. So there's no confusion on you know how many bars have you installed you know did we install three did we install four uh you know if you if you have an exact number of piles and for that for that hole then there should be no confusion on that uh which will help you keep track you know you should be keeping torque logs uh for every bar already um this is just a kind of another layer of you know just conservative conservativity and making sure you uh have a good understanding of, of how deep each element is. And then another thing I wanna, wanna hit on is kind of your overall uh, site staging. So you, you don't want to have all your material for the entire job in one big pile. You, you know, you'd wanna separate out all your, your bar types. <clears throat> so in particular, this is important for stuff like uh, round shaft and the SS5 and SS150 material, because when you look at them visually, they look kind of the same. So what you want to do is establish, you know, all your material and have them grouped together, and, you know, and in a way that you can easily distinguish, okay, those are my RS2875 thin walls and, you know, those are my thick walls. Uh, and, and again, you know, this, this same type of thing applies to the magnet core bars because, you know, we have bars that the outside diameter is exactly the same, the threads are exactly the same. You know, the only thing that's different is the wall thickness. So, you know, having a, a good organized site is going to be, you know, really critical for your for your workflow and, and just making sure that you're, you're mitigating any issues before they arise. Uh, and especially on hollow bar where you where you're not necessarily keeping track of anything uh, for every piece of bar that you're installing, and you're mainly you know, keeping track of it when you hit rock. Okay, well, now we need a five foot rock socket, but you know, how many bars have we installed? Uh, you know, whenever you've got it staged appropriately and you know you have 10 pieces of bar there, uh, you know, if you've only got two left, well, you know you've got 80 feet of bar in the ground. So it's it's going to be pretty uh, pretty helpful to just keep track of things, uh, you know, on every single job you do. Uh, having things staged on, a, on an overall site staging and a per pile staging basis is going to be, you know, very helpful. Um, you want to flip the slide? So on the left here um, is a good example of kind of a site staging. So we make this kind of easy. Uh, our products come palletized already, and, and we're not going to have uh, different bar types on the same pallet. 
So it, it should be pretty easy to to separate out, you know, your your different bar types and, and understand which ones are which. And having this, you know, organized is going to make workflow much better. And on the right here is a good example of a per pile uh, magnet core staging. So it's a little hard to see, but you can see they've got four bars stacked uh, right there at that that close location. And then if you look a little bit further down the picture, there's also four more bars stacked at that next location as well. So the benefit they, they have here is they know exactly how many bars they've got installed. Um, and especially for a magnet core job, you don't want to be taking time to run back to the big stack to grab more material because, you know, the faster you can get a, a magnet core element in the ground, the better. And another thing they've done here with this magnet core staging is they've already got the copper coat anti-seize, uh, you know, bond breaker applied on the end of the bar and the couple is already spun on. So the, the benefit you're going to have here is your workflow is going to be significantly faster uh, for this magnet core element. You're going to know exactly how many bars you have in the ground. And uh, it should just, you know, increase the likelihood of a seamless, smooth install tenfold uh, versus trying to go to your big stack every time, put the copper cord on each time, thread your coupler on each time. Having this all staged uh, appropriately like this is, you know, very critical to just any job site. Um, and it seems like I'm, I'm harping on stuff that you guys probably all already know, but it's, it's good to touch on these things and, and understand, uh, you know, the proper staging for just overall, you know, site workflow. So that's all I had to say on that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that that's really, really good information, you know, especially making sure that your new guys on site who maybe aren't as experienced are setting this up and, and managing that. It's it's definitely just a great way to set yourself up for success. So yeah, you, you don't want to you don't want to be failing on something that, you know, is something that, you know, could have been prevented. You don't want to have a case where you don't know how many pieces of bar are in the ground and it, it can get sticky. So it's really it's really easy to to do this step. And I think it's important. Yep. OK, so. These next slides, uh, I'm going to go over a concept that I've I've run into a few times, and it really highlights the importance of both measuring your torque during installation, and then you know pivoting to a better solution if if you need to. So it can really help you out in the long run. Um, so we had an installation partner that had a project to install helicals for a new building. Uh, There's a medium stiff clay over clay that theoretically should become more stiff with depth. Uh, and the helicals were designed to, you know, estimated to achieve capacity at about 30 feet. And, and that was based on multiple geotechnical boring logs and in situ testing and everything like that. So during their initial installation, uh, they weren't getting torque until around 45 feet. So, you know, 15 feet longer than they, they were originally intending to. And, um, you know, the geotechnical boring logs didn't apply the soils are exactly stated, you know, as they are on the logs everywhere on the site and with that depth. But, you know, other things can happen that cause the in-situ testing to not really be representative of the soils or not, you know, be exactly what the empirical testing shows. So it's important to, you know, understand that it's a geotechnical solution and, you know, geotechnical solutions always have some risk. And so the owner was really upset at the proposed change order that the partner came back with. You know, and so the partner was really, you know, in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and they they came to us for help. You know, they wanted to help help stop the bleeding and see what we could do to help them get to something to, you know, be a little more reasonable. So fortunately, you know, they were able to cool off the owner and they told them that they come to us to help see what we could help do. Um, and Fortunately, they had measured their torque through the entire 45 foot length, the pile that was installed. And they, they brought that to us, those logs to us and the boring logs and asked us to see if we could do anything. So, you know, based on the torque logs, the lead section they used, the boring logs, uh, we came up with an updated soil model to use to come up with an updated, most efficient pile configuration. So it's like we, we basically did our own testing in, in a sense. They did their own testing and they came to us with with what it really was. So uh, as a quick preface, I just wanted to remind everything, you know, helicals are, it's a, it's a bar shaft with flights on it. 
and um, the amount of torque it takes to screw a helical into the ground is empirically, empirically related to the bearing capacity. The harder you have to screw something into the ground, more, like, more than likely the harder and denser that material likely is. Uh, and in this way, we can use the torque measured during installation as a, as a test, like I said, to kind of model the in situ strength conditions of the soils. So uh, they came to us with their original soil model. You can see, you know, you got the 10, 12, 14 lead original soil model in orange. Um, and then the original soil model said it should hit torque, that lead section should hit torque at about 30 feet of pile. However, in red, you can see that they didn't meet the required torque until around 45 feet of pile, where it crosses that target torque uh, at the 10,000. So, so uh, you know, based on the actual pile installation, they didn't hit it till 45 feet. Um, so we took that measured torque in the field, uh, that red line, and we modeled a soil profile in helicap with that same lead section to, to match up to what the torque was uh, in the field. So you use the same soil units, which are all clay, and varied the blow counts until I created that that green line that kind of matched with what you were, what they were hitting in the field. So this green line, we take this green line as our new soil model um, that you then come up with, you know, a new lead section that's the most efficient pile for the pro profile, right? And and as you can see, you know. We, we redesigned to our target low with a number of configurations. The cost effective one showed up. Uh, as you can see, the new lead configuration was a 10, 12, 14, 14. So there's a bolt on extension. And the cost of this bolt on extension was offset, offset the cost of having to do two more bare extension pieces for this element to get to depth. And, and the pile then theoretically needed to be only 32 feet long with that new lead. And uh, they ended up uh, hitting torque before this point on the majority of piles. Obviously, there's going to still be some variation, but um, it, it was a win in my book. Um, so, so these are the major takeaways from this project. You know, we helped our partner with the owner, helped cool them off, and and had a good discussion with them to kind of educate them on on how our elements work and you know pros and cons. And uh, you know, fortunately, our partner had you know collected data during installation, reinforced that behavior in them so that, you know, they know that they can come to us and, and pivot to a better solution in the future if they need to. And, and it just, you know, it's always better to have it than need it than, you know, never have taken it at all. So, and, and one of the best things about this, it really ended up feeling like we were on, all on the same side. You know, we were helping to stop the bleeding. The own, owner came to understand that there's some risk in geotechnical projects. They don't always go as, pran, as planned, you know. And my impression was they, they felt really good about working with that installation contractor. You know, they helped it, They felt that they had their best interests at heart and will definitely, I think, look to them in the future as a trusted resource and installer. Um, so I, I, in, my, my, in my book, it was a, a total win. So, uh, so I'm going to shift it back over to Sam and uh, we're going to talk about load test thrust blocks. Yes, yeah, so you can go ahead and advance the next slide. So uh, this image here kind of shows the, uh, a failed load test essentially and you know you never learn like you learn from your failures right. So the the main issue and it's kind of hard to see in this image but basically the, the pile had shifted to the left and you know this basically was no fault of the the actual geotechnical capacity that this pile uh, pile test failed, but rather not having enough stiffness uh, near the top to resist the bending, uh, which basically resulted in, in a bending at the top and and totally skewing the data, and uh, ultimately a, a failure of the load test. And, and in this particular case, you can kind of see right under that bearing plate. There is basically no soil right there. And in this particular case, they were using a 10, 12, 14 lead section, but they were having troubles uh, getting it installed through some cobbles. So they, they pre-drilled the hole using uh, some smaller flights. And when they pulled it back out of that same hole, you know, you can see that the soil near the top was significantly disturbed 
which basically means you, you know you didn't have much passive resistance from your from your soil to help resist some of that bending near the top and uh, ultimately it was a failed load test because of this so you can go to the next slide so as i was just talking about you know it, it really wasn't any fault of the the pile itself in terms of its actual geotechnical capacity that it failed because if you look at this graph here you know the the working low was 35 kips at 35 kips, you know, we were we were less than 0.2 inches of deflection, which is uh, totally in line with, uh, you know, a passing pile. So, really, this this retest was was no uh, no real reason other than the pile bent at the top, and and they couldn't get the test to test all the way up to the ultimate load. Um, you know, had it had enough stiffness at the top. Uh, which we're going to talk about here on the next slide, but had it have enough stiffness at the top, this pile would have performed, you know, exceptionally well. And they did do something to to retest it and get those proper results. But essentially, we don't want you guys to be doing load tests twice. So you want to understand, you know, when am I going to have a problem with this pile bending at the top? So you can go to the next slide here. So things you want to look out for uh, when you when you pre-drill a hole, you're disturbing the soil. So you have to understand how much is that soil disturbance. If it's a significant amount, um, you know, if you're pulling out a 12 inch helix plate out of that same hole, well, you've got 12 inches of diameter uh, that's gonna be disturbed at the surface, which means it's not gonna really provide much resistance for, for bending. Um, and then another thing you're gonna wanna do is, is your pile head is as close to grade as possible. You know, you wanna have it, basically the, the least amount of exposure as you can get on a job is gonna be the better. Um, and, and only a small amount of this uh, exposed shaft can, can cause this bending, you know, especially in a square shaft where your, your uh, moment of inertia is, you know, considerably lower than what you'd find in a round shaft. Um, and then, you know, are you working with hollow bar? Because hollow bar is a pretty slender element as well. So uh, it's important to, to kind of analyze, you know, on a case by case basis, uh, if you are kind of fitting the bill on something that that might benefit from from adding some additional stiffness to the top of your pile, um, some 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 of the solutions that that you can do, uh, you know, the first is just having your pile as close to grade as you can get it, uh, which is definitely preferred on any load tests, um, you know, other than a tension load test, which the bar comes up through. But for compression load tests. Uh, the closer to grade you are, the, pot, uh, the better, because it's less possibility for, for a bending moment in your pile. And then what we did on, on this job uh, that with that failed, we use an extended pipe sleeve that was welded to the pile cap. So instead of the, the normal new construction cap that may only have like six inches of a sleeve that goes over your pile, you know, if you extend that out to maybe 36 inches or, or 48 inches, that's going to be, you know, a significant amount of extra uh, rotational stiffness at the top there. And then a, another option uh, is casting it into a thrust block. So you're basically, you know, kind of simulating uh, kind of a pseudo footing for your test pile, which is going to, you know, make it behave more like the fixed head condition it would, uh, you know, that the actual pile is going to be in the ground because you're not going to have uh, a pile without a pile cap. Uh, in your production element, so it's going to get it's going to make your pile behave closer to the actual production element and, and greatly reduce you know that risk of of bending and premature failure of your load test. And then another uh, you know very important point to make is you want to have your jack centered over your pile uh, as well as you can because whenever you don't have it centered on that pile, you're you're eccentrically loading that pile, which is going to you know really increase that bending moment. That you have on your pile, so um, it, it can be kind of hard to, to to point out, you know, which jobs are going to be a problem with eccentric loading at the top, or you know, am I going to have a bending problem? So, if you have any questions on a load test you're performing, you know, feel free to reach out, uh, you know, or you can just be proactive and, and use an extended pipe sleeve or cast it into uh, a thrust block, um, and it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where the ASTM uh, doesn't say it's a requirement, um, but you know, if you wanted to do it on every every load test, I, I think it would be kind of a waste of money. But 
it isn't a waste of money when you need it. So it's it's really a fine line. And uh, you know, if you have any questions on your particular test, feel free to reach out and, and we can come up with a solution for, for your particular test. So more on load test sequencing. Um, so as Sean was talking about earlier, uh, geotechnical is not an exact science. Um, you know, we can we can model these things uh, until we're blue in the face, but there's no guarantee that you know something's going to behave as we've got it modeled. There's no guarantee the soil is going to match what the boring is, um, and, and that's why having your your job sequence you know in the correct way is going to become very important. So there's basically you know two types of uh, load tests that a plant set can call out. They can call out pre-production load tests, or they can call out production proof tests of your elements on some number of your production piles. It's generally like five to 10% of your production elements. Um, whenever these load tests are called out, you know, it can be tempting to have one small crew setting up your load test and then have the majority of your crew going ahead and working on these production piles. And in the same case with, with proof tests, it can be it can be easy to just install the whole job and then go back and, and proof out your, your required test piles. And the problem you're gonna run into is, you know, what happens if one of these things fails? You know, if you've got half your job installed and, and you haven't done your pre-production load test and you perform that test and, and you fail, well, you know, now we're gonna have to look at a redesign and you could have to pull out you know, all those piles you've got in the ground if they, if they don't accept the reduced factor of safety. So. You know, sequencing your job correctly can, you know, save potentially costly, uh, you know, a, a high cost of uninstalling those bars, reinstalling them, and another load test. So, you know, you, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you've already lost, you know, the majority of your profit margin before you've even really gotten going. So uh, it, don't, don't fall into temptation uh, trying to work ahead on your jobs. I think that's it. All right. Thanks, Sam. So now I'm going to uh, jump into a concept that's something that comes up pretty infrequently, um, but it's an important concept. Uh, I just wanted to go over to make sure that your design stands up to the test of time. Um, so I'm going to talk about the impact of the water groundwater table on your uh, element, basically helical element design. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty of this, um, but basically, you know, you have what's called a bearing capacity, and that's what the the helical elements rely on. Um, and it's important the bearing capacity between two different soil types, uh, clay or or sands, can be very different, and it's governed by how the soils get their strength. Uh, predominantly, clays rely on their cohesion. That's the the worst case scenario or undrained shear strength. Uh, for sands, their strength is de derived from what we call their internal angle of friction, uh, and another portion of that is what's called the confinement. So basically, um, a simple definition of bearing capacity in the context of our elements is if you put load into the ground through a footing or our element, you know, how much pressure can be exerted on the ground before it gives away. And this is just kind of similar to how, you know, when you're walking in mud, you know, your boots sink sink into the mud when it's really soft and they kind of just uh, break into the soil with a perfect boot print, you know. And, you know, so this is, this is what bearing capacity is and bearing capacity failure. That's what it looks like. So uh, another important thing is, you know, the building loads or, or whatever loads, they don't really happen per the design load at all the time you know so you can build something and the design loads aren't going to be there for a long time but it's it, you know it's really that one set of scenarios where the loads all happen at the same time like wind and ice and seismic you know and that's what overcomes the bearing capacity so you need you know quite a few things to line up so it's not something that happens too often but if you don't take uh, you know a changing water table into account for granular materials it can put your design into a potential condition for failure. So, um, or it's, you know, it's going to be less strength than what you intended for. So uh, another concept that I want to define is what is effective unit weight. Uh, so your, your soil has a density, it has a weight, unit weight. And if it's submerged, 
just similar to, you know, you being in a bathtub, you're going to float, you know, there's, there's a component of force that's applied to the soil, making it want to float a little bit. So that's the, that's the effective unit weight. Then how does this affect bearing capacity? Um, so that term I said earlier, which was confinement, it's related to the weight of the soils above a point in the ground. So for our purposes, you know, at the bottom of a helical, if there's sands that the, the flights are bearing in, those sands rely on confinement or the weight of the soils above them to develop strength. If the soils above that point are half as heavy as they were because a water table shifted up, that can actually half the strength, you know, or more than you originally planned for. So it's really important to perform, you know, multiple analyses with the granular material to make sure that if the water table comes up, you're good for reasonable, you know, loss in strength. You know, another way to think about this confinement thing um, uh, would be like if you're trying to unscrew a jar lid, if the lid is wet, if you try to loosely grip the lid and spin it, your hand just slips off of it. But if you like really grip down on that lid, even though the amount of water on the lid didn't change, you have a better chance of getting the torque to apply to the lid. So same thing that, you know, sands need that same grip force or normal force or confinement um, to, to hold the particles together so they don't slip on one another. Um, and they get that from being buried in the ground. So, so uh, another part of this is, you know, when I get the boring log information, they give me the water table, you know, should I just use that? And if you read into the, the geotechnical reports, which I'm sure you're all doing, um, you know, unless there's some long-term investigation, they usually have some verbiage in there that says, you know, this was the groundwater table at the time of drilling, seasonal changes can, you know, lead to other different water tables. So, you know, there, there's definitely, you should definitely do a parametric analysis. So you're doing, you know, multiple analyses with varying groundwater table and see where it causes your design to fail um, and use your design, you know, use your judgment if that's a possibility. So if your groundwater table at drilling is 10 feet deep and your design fails at eight feet of groundwater table, well, that's probably pretty reasonable that your groundwater table is going to be there. But if it's all the way at the top and you're up on a bluff, maybe that's not reasonable. So you would be good. So, so I'm going to go through uh, two examples um, of heel, heel cap profiles that uh, this first one is clay. The second one's going to be sand. So um, you can see on the left and the right, it's the same clay profile. I have the same, you know, strength parameters in there with the same pile types, lengths and lead sections. Um, on the on the left side, I have a groundwater table that's at the very surface of the profile. And then on the right, I have a the groundwater table 10 feet deep. So since the worst case strength condition for the clays doesn't really rely on the effective unit weight, the ultimate capacities are dead on each other at 12 kips. So, you know, this groundwater table is not affecting this. They're, they're exactly the same. But if we do the same thing with sands, having the same blow counts as each other, same, you know, lead section, same bar, the only difference is I, I have a different water table you can see that the ultimate recommended helix capacity is half when you have a lower water table. So that right profile, the upper sands, they don't have a water table, so they are not uh, lighter, essentially. So it's applying more confinement at the helix lead flights. So it's heavier, so it confines it more, so it's like you're gripping it stronger, and it's able to, to grip the soils better. So you know, when we're doing this comparison and we think that there's a potential for the groundwater table to go up that high, that doesn't mean that it's going to fail automatically. You know, it, it really depends on how the design loads we plan to put onto the pile are in relation to our estimated strengths. And we have to consider if we think that the groundwater will rise to that level, if, it, if that's reasonable. So, so like I said, you know, you have to compare your design load with what capacity you're getting to be able to consider what it is, what's the worst case scenario. So, you know, if we have a, you know, 12 kip ultimate pile, that profile, you know, on the left was a 10.6 kip ultimate capacity. So if you compare that 10.6 kip ultimate capacity to a design load of, say, it's six kips design load, 
our factor of safety is actually 1.77, which is still pretty good. You know, that's that's probably reasonable depending on you know what the owner is willing to do and what the engineer of record for the for the project is willing to go with. So you know, if you're normally at that 10 foot, you know, groundwater depth, you have way more capacity than you need. So you know that pile should be good in most cases. So my last set of slides, I'm going to go over a topic that I've discussed a few times with Gary at Chance. Uh, I've really looked to wrap my head around this product line, and I and I think I have a good idea of, of what's going on. So the you know preface of all this is you know Atlas resistance piers. You know you have your lead section with friction collar, extension sections, top pier plate and bracket, and drive stand. You're basically you're pushing this pipe pile into the ground that has a friction reduction collar at the at the leading edge, and you just push it reacting against the building um, to push all the way down. So um, the overall concept, you either you have to push it to one and a half times the design load or, or until the the building moves. So the common question is, how do you push the pier to more capacity than the building weighs? And the answer comes down to that friction reduction collar. You know, it, it allows us to not drag along the entire hole of the pile while you advance. And, and I'll show you a graphic way of describing this, but you're, you're basically relying on that point load at the very tip of the pile to, to push the soils away. It's, it's like a bearing capacity with depth. Um, so here's an example of a resistance pier going into the ground. You know, you have a pipe section and friction reduction collar. As you can see, that friction reduction collar, it's creating an annulus that allows the pipe section to be free of the soil as the pipe advances. So you're not dragging the pipe all the way down. Um, so you'll be able to continue to penetrate through softer materials um, because you're only you know, putting the pressure through that friction reduction collar at the tip. And then that happens until the load and pressure in the tip of the pile hits something that's hard enough to stop it based on the load that you're pushing into the ground with. And you're relying on something having enough capacity to withstand the advancement. Um, so it's got it's got to be very hard. So it's an end bearing pile basically. So once you get to this point, you know, the soils are going to relax and they're going to set back up on the pile and, and it'll create engagement between the pile and the soil even more. So you'll you'll push with the weight of the building and theoretically you know, if you have piles on a five foot interval, you're probably utilizing more than five feet of the building weight to push that. So you're you're able to push harder than your your support interval, as well as you're pushing the soil and not dragging it with depth um, to create your resistance. So based on those two things, you're able to get a much stronger pile than the support you're needing to provide. Mm -hmm.